I'm not a celebrity. I'm just not. <laughs> like, I know what you said. I know what you think. I know what I've done, but I don't. I don't feel that way in my heart. I feel like an, I'm an artist. So, um, Jill, I feel like I have to start this podcast telling you about my ex boyfriend, who I don't like to talk about often. <laughs> I'm married now, so I, I, found, I found the one for me. Yeah. This one ex. The only reason that I will not forever say shitty things about him, because I could say a lot of shitty things about him, is because the one light he brought to my life is that he introduced me to you. <laughs> and he, oh, okay. yeah, no, I know, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't ruin the experience. But literally what happened was he, I think I'd seen getting out of the way, um, or getting in the way rather, on the video on MTV. I think I just saw it briefly. But it was a huge snowstorm in Detroit. I'm from Detroit. And he had tickets to see you at St. Andrews. And he was just like, you got to go to this concert. Jill Scott is dope. Blah, 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 blah. It is, I mean, it was a blizzard out there. There was nobody on the freeway. And I drove an hour and a half to come see you at St. Andrews Hall. And because of the snowstorm, it wasn't a huge crowd. It was a nice crowd, but not huge. That still remains easily one of the five best concerts I've ever been to in my life. And we didn't make it, thank God, but me and you made it, Jill. We here hey. I was not going to give you up for him. That just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> All right? <laughs> but I have been such a fan of yours for a long, long time since you came out. A day one, for sure. And, of course, I remember when you did the interlude with The Roots, because The Roots are my favorite rap group ever. I've been with them for day one, too. Um, your peoples. But when I tell you that... I'm probably going to get more enjoyment out of this than you will. That is probably an understatement. You are my favorite. And that is just no lie. I am not gassing you yes. up because of this. I fucking love you. So yes. this is an <laughs> amazing moment for me right now. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remove the fangirl from me right now and just focus on this interview so we can learn all things Jill Scott. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you have meant to my life. Um, because your music is a is a vibe, it's an emotion, it's a feeling, it transfers you to a place and through a thing. And I was reading some things that you said about who is Jill Scott, um, your first album, which last year turned 20, and we'll uh, get into that a little more, but um, you, I can't believe that you, you actually said that you didn't think that anybody would feel this album. Why did you think that? It, in hindsight, I don't know, but at the time, honestly, it was, it was, um, it was my, I don't, how do I explain this thing? I just did something that came from my heart. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bunch of rocket science. It wasn't a bunch of producers around telling me what I should do or how I should do. I was just doing it because that's the way I felt. Not that I have that now, but you know, specifically for then at my at my age, I was what, 27, I think. You know, I was just doing it. And when I look back and I'm like, oh, there was all this production and all these background vocals for other people's music. And I was like listening to their stuff and then I listened to mine and I was like, nobody's gonna like it. I I, I still can't believe how it has impacted people's lives still to this day it blows my mind and even now I try to listen to it and I'm like that's pretty damn good it's, it's pretty damn good I'm so glad that you feel this way I'm so glad that like you went and loved it I'm so I'm I'm just appreciative like thank you thanks <laughs> no it's true and um it, it, it every year that I couldn't see you in concert, I think I've only seen you twice, and I consider that to be my my fault. It's not yours, clearly, <laughs> but we were never uh, in sort of the same region at the same time. But the last concert that I was going to go to um, was when you were at Radio City, yeah. I believe it was twenty nineteen, or you were supposed to be there twenty twenty, right? Yeah, I know, one of those. It's it's, <laughs> it's a lot of blur. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, it's a lot of blur. I would tell people definitely like try to document everything because you won't remember. You you just won't. It's too many. It's too many moments. It's too many highs. Imagine imagine getting like shit face drunk, you know, every night. You're not going to remember those nights. And that's kind of like what being on stage is, is this euphoric, overwhelming release of energy. And then all of this energy flushing back in your direction. You're not going to remember everything. You only remember that you love it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, how did you, uh, I mean, some people, they get a they get a sample of this on Jill Scott experience where you take them through your concert experience. Yeah. And that's what blew me away about it because I'd never been to a concert like yours before. And I was a little mad because you changed the songs and how you did them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the album's great uh, uh, um, in itself. But then I was like, but I kind of want to hear the concert version. And then you, it's like you read my mind and you make the concert experience. But how did you put together doing your concert in your particular way because you take your audience through a complete experience. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. Um, I work a lot with the musicians. Um, I talk to them in colors and in scenarios. Um, I, I do get bored. You know, so after about seven or eight months doing the songs the same exact way, I'm like, OK, there's another way to tell this story. There's another way to tell the story in another way. And then it just started growing into something else. My ideas come from a lot of them anyway. They come from Bette Midler. They come from Frankie Beverly, you know, seeing their concerts when I was a child, seeing their concerts while I was adult. It's that uh, connection to the audience that I love. It's the 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 actor in me wants to perform and be in the moment and give you the story, you know, so you can feel it too. Like for me, the, the goal is for my audience to feel something. And those moments when I look out and I see my brothers, my men hugged up on that joint, all sweet and nice. And I know it's popping later on. It makes me so happy when I look at them and I see them like emotional, you know, and in tears. I know that they're having a moment and they need to. So it's it's like for me that the show needs to be uh, part theater, part uh, storytelling. Um, and and definitely therapy in a in a lot of ways because you know we're more alike than we are different. Well, that um, leads right into what I think is what I know is my favorite Jill Scott tweet of all time, where you tweeted, "Hi, I sing act out all kinds of stories. You should come to my shows. After a Jill Scott show, most people get splendidly laid." by whoever they came with, hashtag, if they don't F it up, hashtag, stop fronting, if you suck dick too. Hey. And also, usually go on to happier, more productive, focused, wealthy lives. That was a word and a TED talk all together. <laughs> Listen, yeah, all those things. All those That's, things. All those things. That's the goal. I want I want you to walk away excited and and thriving and want to, you know? That's the goal. You sing about sexuality and sensuality in a different way than a lot of artists. What shaped how you decided to sing about those things? Hmm. I listened to the way sex was described by men and I thought they're just they they're just busting nuts like that's it like they're not they're not in the moment they're not experiencing the the real real and I don't want that for my my sisters I want them to to know what it is there is actual screwing and that's great and there's also making love and it's a huge difference so it's, it's the same acts but it's a huge difference when there's a connection there and um, my mother has always been very open and free with me. My aunts, um, very open and free when it came to sex and sexuality. And I just don't see any reason for me to pretend like I'm I'm not these things. 
Yeah, I like to read a book or two. Yeah, I like to work in the garden. Yeah, I like to go fishing. Yeah, I like to spend some money on some Louis Vuitton every now and then. But I like to fuck too. And I also <laughs> like to make love. And I prefer that if I could get it. And then some fucking too. <laughs> well, if anybody has listened to the lyrics of Crown Royal, I mean, they should know Jill ain't fucking around. <laughs> <You know>? mm. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that is mm-hmm. that song is probably the it's just the perfect um two and a half minutes if you will, <laughs> for a lot to happen in the course. <laughs> yeah. of I, that song. Ooh, I, I, that's one of my favorites. I honestly, you know, I love the way that I express those those visions, those mm. pictures. You know, your your hands on my hips pull me right back to you. Like you already know what it's hitting for. You already know. Exactly. You know, you know about what you're about to get. Yo, it's so deep. I'm breathing for you. What? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Grab my braids, arch my back high for you. Like what? <laughs> Your diesel engine. I'm squirting mad oil. This is my favorite podcast conversation of all time. Already. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, already. Um when you think about uh, how you craft the songs that you craft, what is it something that you have had to personally experience or can you write from other experiences that you derive from the people in your life? Yeah, I can write from, obviously I can write from my own experiences and I listen to my friends. You know, I've been blessed mm-hmm. to have some really incredible women that share their stories with me. And um, normally there's some similar huge similarities between them and I and then I kind of stir the the pot like the the men that I've dated they're like that song's about me I'm like it's this a partly about you but it's also about somebody else too you know what I mean I, I stir it up so that I can create a story for you you know to to give you images and to create feelings you know um that's that's the goal you know so <sighs> Yeah, it's not about you, dog. <laughs> well, well, at least tell me that why you wrote Crown Royal. You were sipping Crown Royal. Like, is that no? <laughs> Honestly, at the time, I had never had Crown Royal. That makes it even better. That you did that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a metaphor for a king that I had to put on ice. Now we're getting to it. Okay, <laughs> a metaphor. I'm gonna think very deeply about this song now. Um, did you always want to be a performer? No, I wanted to be a English teacher first, and then I wanted to be a psychologist. And, uh, then I wanted to be an actor and, uh, and it kind of all just happened. (laughs) All of it. Now, I read that, that you initially, when you and uh, Questlove, you and Amir first met, that you told him you could write songs, but you couldn't actually write songs. No, no. <laughs> what happened? happened? Um, he came to a poetry reading, and uh, I guess I did well that night. And he's like, "So, do you write songs, right?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I write, I, I write songs. I write a lot of things." He's like, "So, can you come in and, and and write a hook for me?" And I was like, "Okay, you know, first of all, it's the roots, and uh, you know, at the time." And now, you know, that was a huge, big, a huge deal for me, you know, just to be in the studio with them or to be anywhere near them. So I was geeked and I lied and I went into the studio and um, Scott Storch and I talked and blazed for I don't know how long. And then he played a melody and then I was I just said it. I just said it as I was writing it on the paper and it all came out in one I didn't even lift the, the pen off the paper, just just wrote. And then I said it back and Scott said, what'd you say? And I said, if you are worried about where I've been or who I saw or what club I went to with my homies, he was like, what? I was like, it goes like this. And then I sang it and he was like, can you record it? I was like, yeah. You know, I just, Look, there's really no other way for me to put this thing. I am exceptionally blessed. Real rap from the beginning. I saw a lot of things coming out of North Philadelphia 
there were a lot of things that definitely could have swayed my path. And this, this journey, I just turned 49 a couple of days ago. And this journey has just been so dope. Like this is my favorite life. This is the best one I've ever had. And I think it's because one, God loves me so, so, so much. But two, uh, not even but, and two, um, I'm really following my little heart. That's, that's about the gist of it. You know, I wanted to write. I called producers in Philadelphia, nobody answered. And eventually bumped into Jazzy Jeff on the street. And he was like, who's that? And Rich Medina said, that's Jill Scott. He was like, oh, that's Jill Scott. Then he let me come in. I guess he saw me and thought I was halfway cute. And he let me come in and they wouldn't let me write. But they let me stay in polyurethane in the lobby. And that was fine enough. I heard, I say, I heard that was quite an experience. Eh. <laughs> Staining in polyurethane in a lobby. My mom taught me. And it needed to be done and I needed to be there. I didn't want to get there and them say, okay, you know, it was nice to meet you. You know, you don't look how we need you to look or you don't act the way we need you to act. So, and that happened. So, you know, nice meeting you, take care. I needed to come back again and again and again. And I needed them to see me on a regular basis and, you know, have conversations about something and nothing. And I needed to ear hustle. What's that they're playing? What's that? And then, you know, I'd slide in to ask a question and say, oh, could I could I get a copy of that? And they say, you know, all right. And they gave me tapes. That's how long ago it was. They gave me tapes and it was mostly my whole first album. I think I read that for the first album, you actually did like 50 songs. I don't know. That's not true. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, yeah, honestly, right. I don't know. It was it was okay. a lot, mm -hmm. but it was fun. And we were broke. Everybody was so broke and we shared cheesesteaks and they picked me up, gave me rides sometimes, you know, it, it was it's still one of the best times of my life. And those producers went on, you know, and they produced Mariah Carey and Michael Jackson and Music Soul Child and I mean Mary J. Blige and the list, Usher, you know, the list just goes on. I think because we were all innocent in so many ways and there was just a light in our heart for a thing. So we did the thing. And we, you know, somewhere I'm sure we suffered, you know, in some way, but I don't remember that. That part doesn't count. It's like giving birth to a baby. Like, yeah, I know, I know. But, you know, the outcome is just, it's a beautiful life. 2020 was supposed to be a, a 20th anniversary celebration of who is Jill Scott. Yeah. You had a huge tour that was planned. And of course the pandemic shut it down, but, um, how much did you reflect on what that album has meant to people last year in particular, even though you weren't able to perform it the whole year, but the fact that it turned 20 and it's almost like it came out last week. Like it it's timeless. Like it. Yeah. How, what does that mean to you to know you produced something that was timeless? Damn. Damn. Yo, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy and a privilege and like, um, I'm I'm happy about it, you know. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I'm I'm happy about it. I loved that when I walked on stage in the beginning, played, and it was like J I L L, and everybody was just going crazy. I was like, look at this. This is amazing. Every word, word for word, people sang every single word. As a writer, which that is what I am first. As a writer, that is. It's a dream. It's a dream come true. I don't I don't want to wake up from that. It's it's incredible. I don't have the words. There's nothing that fills it. Just looking out and seeing all these strangers, but they're not because they know a part of me. You know, it's not everything. It's it's certainly not everything, but they know a part of me and they relate and they gravitate to it. And then 
you know, it becomes a part of their everyday lives, you know, washing dishes, <laughs> bathing the babies or, you know, making some good old love, you know, it's good shit. There's not a fan of yours alive that every time they either eat grits or make grits doesn't go grits. <laughs> So you you gave us that as well, <laughs> not one, <laughs> impossible. Um, it's, it's a question I ask every guest on this podcast. Uh, tell me about the first time that you felt famous. Do you have Strawbridge and Clothier? No, was it Strawbridge's or was it, Ma it was Macy's. Macy's, okay. It was Macy's. Macy's was a very big deal for me because that was one of those stores I don't covet. You know, like if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. I ain't tripping on it. I'm move on, you know. But Macy's was one of those stores. I was like, I would love to shop at Macy's. And I had moved to New Jersey with my ex-husband. And they had a Macy's day. And that meant that everything was like 40 to 60% off, particularly kitchenware. And I decided that I was going to go and get a new spatula. And I was going to get a new blender. Very exciting for me. Okay. So I go into the to, to the store. I get the, the blender. I get the spatula. Everything is great. And on the way up, I look and I saw the shoe department and I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of shoes. I look over, but there's a whole bunch of people in that area. And they all turned and looked at me. And I was like, then they started running and screaming. And the running and screaming sparked other people in the area to run and scream. And I, all I could hear was my name. It's Joe Scott, it's Joe Scott, it's Joe Scott, it's Joe Scott. And the people from the mall started running into the Macy's and I ran. I ran as hard and as fast as I could, and I hid. <laughs> Where did you hide? <laughs> I found a little corner. They had a rack of the one of those round racks, and it was a little corner, and it was right by the door. And I kind of hid in there, waiting for everybody to, to go away. That's when I knew I found out I had anxiety. I didn't know that either. I had no idea. That's when I was like, I don't know if I like this part. Because I'm just like, hey, and they're like running in my direction and screaming and it freaked me out. I think that was the moment I was like, oh, this fame thing. I don't know. I don't know if I like her. I still don't know. Well, how do you balance it because the kind of music you make is so personal and emotional so people probably feel like they know you in a much different way than other artists like i i can only imagine how starstruck fans some of the stories they might tell you and share much like i just did when i was like yo so meet my ex let me just tell you what happened and because of the type of music so how do you handle that part of it is that you make something that automatically makes people feel so connected to you but we don't know you. I don't know what to do. All I could do is try to explain a little bit as I go along. Like, listen, guys, I am, I'm not, I'm not a celebrity. I'm just not. <laughs> like, I know what you said. I know what you think. I know what I've done. But I don't, I don't feel that way in my heart. I feel like an, I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm a Renaissance artist. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm an actor. I'm a poet. I'm a singer. You know, I sing different genres of music. I don't feel like a celebrity. I, that's not, that was never my goal. That was never the, you know, any part of me ever thought about famous or being famous. And, and I, I guess, you know, people are like, oh, that's so, so dumb. Yeah, I guess so. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't something I even thought about. And then I had to deal with it. I lost some family members and I don't mean they passed. I mean that they had to get out of my life. You know, I I'd lost some friends um, because they had to get out of my life. I was like, you or you, or, I, I stopped speaking to my mother, which is major for about uh, six months because she felt fanny to me. 
And I would explain, I'm like, mom, I don't need that. I need you to be my mom. You know, I, I need you to be my mom. It's a lot going on. There's a, there's, you know, more money than I ever had. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with it. I, I don't, I've, there's more people calling themselves my friends. Like, I need you to just stay grounded with me because this is a lot to, to take in. I'm grateful, but I'm also having to deal with the reality of being famous. You know, new people <laughs> playing my music at like three or four in the morning, driving by the house, blasting it, you know, because they want me to hear it. I heard it. I did it. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like y'all, it's still me. It's, it's still the John that, that walks to the 33 bus, you know, and waits for it, you know, or runs for it rarely. But, you know, it's still me. And that is the part that I hold on to the most. That's the part that's most important to me. The, 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 the woman, you know, the, the mom, the, the truth seeker, the, the student, you know, the lover, um, those, those things are, are more important to me than everything else. I don't want to lose that. You know, that whole thing about, you know, gaining the world and losing your soul. I'm not interested. No, thanks. You know, I like money, so don't get me wrong. I enjoy, I enjoy being able to buy <laughs> some shit and um, share it with, you know, others. You know, I, I do. But at the same time, you know, I really enjoy going to Target. I love that place. And now that I got a mask, and if I don't wear a special mask, and I don't do my eyes or nothing, you know, and they I don't know you, they honey, don't know I you? can stay all day, all <laughs> day. You can stay all day. Get my mm -hmm. little coffee, put my earbuds in, and just you know, go down the aisles, take my sweet time. So, how did you repair the relationship with your mom? She got it. She got it. I came home from the road and I had been on the road for about two years and I came home limp. I had nothing, nothing. And um, <laughs> my grandmother washed me up in the shower while I cried. And my my mom put me put, put me in one of her nightgowns and they put me in my grandma's bed. You know, they don't they don't tell you, you know, how how grueling, you know, touring can be, you know, they don't, they don't really prepare you for that. Next thing you know, you're doing it. And, uh, I loved so much of it. You know, it was on my list of things to do was to see the world. And here I am, North Philly John in Paris, like what? Can't fit a damn thing. There's nowhere to buy anything for me, you know, at the time. Um, but I'm I'm in Amsterdam. I'm I'm in Japan. I'm I'm like in Germany, like all over. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, I just needed the balance, you know. I now I know how to tour. Now I know you don't tour for two years straight. I understand. You know, if if the goal is is a lot of money, then great. I like to make money, like I said, but I also need the balance. And now I have a child, you know, that needs to see me and smell me and talk to me and, you know, all of those important things. You know, he needs he needs my love and guidance. And, you know, I just make sure that I tour for a couple of months and then I come home and I hang out and I pot shit. You know, and I roll shit. <laughs> you, know, like, like, you know, I balance. I try to balance this out. I make sure I, you know, sweep my kitchen floor. Simple things that keep me grounded. It's important to me. What happens when somebody gets so fancy, you know, that they forget that they're just a person? The fall is a lot harder. The fall is a lot harder. And I know, you know, falls always happen to everyone. You know, I just don't want to, I just don't want to explode when I do. You know what I mean? I, I, I'd like my fall to be a little cushy if I could help it. <laughs> do you actually own a dustpan? Cause that, oh, yeah. that
that determines <laughs> just what what uh, what, uh, what scale of homegirlness you still are. Because <laughs> we, I swear, I didn't. I, we didn't have a dustpan. It was like an album cover, a sheet. I mean, a a piece of paper. Like I didn't see a dustpan until I got to college. I was like, oh, this is what these are. Okay. All right. <laughs> this is why I can't front. This is new. I didn't know this. I just didn't know it. Sue me. You know how the long stem dustpan is you just got the handle, you yeah. know, and the little broom that's attached with the little clicker. You like click it in right. there and take yeah. it off. Those prongs on the bottom of the dustpan, they're for uh -huh. you to get the stuff out of the broom. So the dust Wait, pan, what? Yeah. So the dustpan goes like that, right? Right. And there's these little things like hairs or yeah, yeah, yeah that are always yeah. Yeah. You use that to get whatever you can. Like let's say you're getting your hair braided. And you got hair all over the place. In order to get the the hair out, you just use the dustpan, use the little prongs on the dustpan to get all the hair out. I didn't know that was new to me. Uh, that is new to me as well. And if you work in a salon, you know. But I didn't know. What? I was like, oh, all this time I've been getting a wet paper towel and pulling the. Yeah, he pull it. That's what I do. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> oh man, now I just feel ridiculous. Okay, I, all I right. feel the same. Yeah. I feel the same. I hope I found a whole compartment on my on my oven the other day. I didn't even know it was there. I was like, oh, you can put the pans. Oh, you know, it's the simple things for me, man. I I just love it. It's it's I, one I, box. I think that should be a show. Discovering shit with Jill Scott. <laughs> That should be a show right there. I watch it for sure, just to see you discover things around your house that you didn't know how they worked. It's the it's the wonder of it all. It's it's you know there's so much to to be amazed about. Little simple things. I'm into that life. You know, it's, it really is the simple things for me. Speaking of your amazing life, uh, there is a lot more I want to ask you about the podcast. Um, obviously, First Wives Club, which, which I adore, and just all the different things that you are, are doing. You listed all the things, you know, being a poet, a writer, a singer, an actor, but you could easily add 25 more descriptions to your list because you are doing a lot of stuff. So I want to uh, ask you about some of those projects. But for now, we'll just take a very quick break and we'll be back with more Discovering Shit with Jill Scott. Um, I think because uh, you have such an earthy style and people see you as this very calm person that I think people think that you don't have a ratchet side. Do you have a ratchet side, Jill Scott? I'm going I'm to give it to you raw. Um, I grew up in it very early. I grew up in a household that had some violence attached to it. And because I couldn't harm the man that was violent, uh, physically violent to my mother, and so occasionally to myself. Uh, when somebody challenged me uh, as a kid, I did the most. It wasn't just a fight, it was brutal. And I remember thinking, if I don't collect this, I'm gonna go to jail or I'm gonna kill somebody. And um, early on, I found a, I found a lot of ways not to be so, you know, rah, rah with it because okay. I don't. Yeah, because I just that part of myself, uh, the, the child that couldn't defend my mother or myself, it still exists. So I try my best to keep it real easy because I don't want to hurt nobody like that. Yeah. Would you have ever described yourself as a bully? Never. Okay. Mm -mm. I don't mm -hmm. like bullies. Never. When you think about how you grew up and think about the parent that you are now, um, what was, in raising your son, what was it important for you uh, to make sure he learned or understood or felt from you as his mom? Well, there's been so many lessons. <sighs> I think a big one was that no one is above you and no one is beneath you. And um, 
just because we're, we're growing up in different ways. You know, I grew up in a house with one bathroom and he's growing up in a house with 10. It's a, it's a different vibe. You know, I, I had a couple pairs of shoes a year. He's, he's got a closet, you know, full, you know, it's a different ex life experience. We went without, you know, um, not often, but often enough and severe enough to never forget it. So, you know, I don't need him to be an asshole. You see the, the kids, you know, with their parents got some money, so they're just jerks. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't want that for him. And, you know, that is, that is really important for him not to be a jerk. You know, <laughs> like, I just don't want that for him. We had this conversation it, uh, today in the car. You know, I was like, oh, yo, okay. really? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're a really nice guy. And people are going to try to play you because you're a really nice guy. But I need you, you know, to continue boxing so that you know how to hold your hands if necessary. Um, and he's he's good with his. And um, I need him to know how to count his money. That's important, you know. And um, I need him to remember that everybody, you know, is a human being. And, and that um, being him is is super important in everything that he does. Not Jill Scott's son. I know you. I'm, you know, I'm like we are, we got that understanding. You know, I'm your mom. You you know my you're my kid. But you are you. You know, we just we just had this conversation today on the way to the dentist, getting a visa line. <laughs> but um, is it? I guess it, this is. It feels weird to say this because I, I don't think there was a time in history where it wasn't. But in this climate, especially this racial climate, what is it like for you, you know, raising a young black boy? Terrifying. Because it doesn't matter if you have or you don't. All that matters is that you're brown. That's it. So, you know, he's he's turning 12 shortly, um, April 20th. Uh, and in and four years after that, he's, I know he's going to want a car, you know, and he saved up so that he can get a car, you know, and it's still saving and we'll get a job before he gets a car. OK, uh, <laughs> I don't care where you work, you're going to work somewhere. Uh, but <laughs> just to know that he'll be on the road, you know, just to know that he'll be away from from people who love him in, in a world that will decide whether he's guilty of something because he's brown. You know, that that's terrifying. And it, it makes me consider leaving this place often. We talk about it a lot as a family, like, you know, where would we go? And um, we're currently in Nashville. And if it doesn't work out here, then it's time to, to leave. There's you mean leave, leave the states or, or leave Nashville? This, yeah, leave this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain things that, that that you don't have to deal with. There's other things that you have to deal with, but there's certain things that you don't have to deal with in other countries. And um, it's specific other countries, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at Holland. We like Holland. Holland, they, huh? Yeah, they chilling. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they have great health care. Um, they they ride their bikes everywhere. So people are pretty fit. Um, they they speak more than Dutch, like several different languages. Most people do three or four different languages. That's dope. The um, it's un below sea level. So the the food is really well hydrated. You so, haven't really looked into this. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Yeah. The education is, is dope. The health care is dope. You know, uh, there's very few um, confines on your personality. You know, if, if you want to you want to go get some ass, you want to buy some ass, ain't nobody tripping on you. If that's what you want to do, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I, not that that's what I want to do, but I'm just <laughs> saying, like, I like the idea of people being able to be free as long as they're not harming anybody else. That's what's up. 
it's, it's, I say this all the time to people um, having, I've not been to as many countries as you have, but I think I've been to about 32 now. Woo! And yeah, you know, the life of a journalist, it does get I you some love places. It. And um, I tell people, I said, you know, that whole greatest country in the world thing, it's an affirmation. Just mm. remember that. It's not, it's not something that's in a stone tablet. It's mm-hmm. not something written in the Bible. It is an affirmation or an aspiration. It's mm-hmm. not actually true once you start right. traveling the world. And that's not to shit on where we live because we live a, a good life um, yes, in America. Yes, but at the same time, it is so many places that have such an enriched, enhanced idea. I mean, it's, it's still backward shit that the fact that we don't provide family leave mm. for everybody here is like, you know, and, and paid maternity leave. That's not yes. a thing in America. It's a thing at a lot of other places, right? And so as yeah. you travel, you figure out just how much longer we have to go and how we mm-hmm. kind of buy into our own exceptionalism a little too much. A little too much. Mm-hmm. One, I love, um, I love Japan. I love Japan for the architecture. I love it for the for the culture, how rich it is in culture. I love that if you drop a tissue or a napkin or a gun, gum wrapper, somebody's going to pick it up and bring it to you because it's yours. Don't you drop something on the street. That's your trash. You carry your trash. You got to put your cat trash in, a, in your pocket until you get to a trash can. I, I like that. But, you know, the age of consent there is 13. Is it really? Yeah, it is. What? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Right. Yeah. You, know, you got your, your highs and your lows yeah. everywhere you mm. go. So like I, I tell my girlfriends in relationships, you get to pick your issues. And where you live, you know, you should be able to pick your issues. The world is big enough, you know, to find find your joy, find your lane, and find your peace of mind. So, so thus far... Uh, we're, we're happy thus far. Well, one thing um, I've noticed is that, and you were probably always this way, but obviously social media, it gives people a window into how you think and feel about the world, more so than your music does. Um, and I'm really uh, interested and entertained in, in your decision to have your own podcast. Uh, J. Ill, the podcast that J. is Ill, yeah. J. Ill, um, yeah. where you're talking about a wealth of different issues, um, you know, uh, black maternity, black love, like so many different things. Um, why did the podcast medium, why did that appeal to you? Well, one, because we didn't have to be on camera. You know, I loved when I was a kid, I would overhear my, my mom and, and her sisters talking drinking Manischewitz, you know, had, listening to Millie Jackson, talking that good talk about a good thing. I used to love that. And my mom said, if you are quiet and you don't let us see you, then you can listen. And that's what I did. And I thought the conversations that Aja and Laia were and I were having, like somebody else should hear this too. Like what if, you know, everybody else could be the kid hiding, you know, behind the pillow, you know, listening to their aunties have a conversation. Like, let's do that. I thought it would be nice. Hmm. Yeah, an homage uh, to them. Oh, well, um, and you also are, are quite honest on it as well. Is that something that is in any way scary for you? Because you're letting people in to your life in a different way through this podcast. Um, no, I'm loved. I'm loved and I'm honest anyway. So, you know, ah, it is what it is. This is the life of an artist. You know, this is the difference between, you know, artist and celebrity. We're supposed to bear our souls, whether it's in some kind of song or in in a painting or, you know, in a play or we're supposed to bear our souls. That's the job. And it, you know, whatever fear I had about it before, I don't have it anymore. You know, especially after the microphone thing, like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like I honestly and sincerely was telling a story and I 
I thought about it when it, you know, popped up on social media and everybody was like, oh, my God, that's a thing. This is a thing. Jeff Scott is. I, I never put a microphone in my mouth or anything. I just made it. I made you believe I did. I was telling the story. And that's when I just found my peace with it. Like, you know, at first I felt bad and then I obviously had to talk to my son, you know, but he had been to my shows and we had already had these conversations about what it was and what it was was um, women giving their A game to people who don't deserve it because they think they're supposed to. That's what we were talking about. And if it hadn't cut off, I'm pretty sure I, you know, I said at some point, you know, that this, you know, they didn't deserve it. You know, or is he or is she doing this, 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 and this? Are they listening? Are they kind to you? Do they care? Are they generous? Um, are they patient with you? Is, is that your friend? Or is this, is this something to do? If it's something to do, you can't give them your A game, babe. That that ain't for everybody, <laughs> you know. But anyway, this thing came out, and um, I just had to make peace with it. Like, you know, I did it, I did it, and I meant it. I was telling a story. I'm a storyteller, and that's I'm going to stand on that until the wheels fall off. This is my this is my job in life. However, I get to tell the story, whether it's on paper or in a song or on stage or in front of a camera, this is what I'm going to do. And um, it's better when I'm completely vulnerable and it's better when I'm honest. And the rest, this is my life. This is the one I get. So I'm going to do with it. I'm going to do my thing with it. Is that a confidence that you had to grow into or have you sure. always had? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Lived experience, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every time I did anything, you know, if it would get like a lot of attention and it would scare me because too, you know, I've, I've, I got anxiety, you know, and when it's a bunch of people, I didn't tell you that when I ran away in that Macy's, I broke out in hives head to toe, you know, like I have to find a way to, balance this thing for my own peace of mind or I can retreat that happens to a lot of artists you know they they get famous and it's a lot of pressure and then they're trying to be something so hard or something people think they are so hard that they lose their mind that they you know try or do more drugs than they should you know or become more and more outrageous just to keep up. And I don't want that for me. That's, I'm just not interested. I really, I really like the simple things. I really like meeting people and talking about something or nothing, weather. Oh, you don't know how happy it makes me just to talk to, to a stranger about the weather. It's a pretty day, huh? And if they give me something back, I'm like, yeah, it was nice on Thursday. <laughs> it makes me so happy. I can't even begin to tell you. So I find these little quaint towns all over America and I go there just so I could meet strangers and talk about whatever. Do people sometimes, recognize you? Uh, you okay, sometimes. Mm. Sometimes. And I know how long I can stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, for whatever reason, you know, you're your body of work or what they saw you in precedes who you actually um, are. And, and not that it's not me, it is me, but you got a, a little bit, you, you, you got a little bit and I am, I contain multitudes. So that's good that you, it's probably good for your spirit that you still have those pockets of anonymity yeah. in places. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you need uh, that. I saw, or I read rather, um, when I think you were asked uh, on somebody else's podcast, I forget which one, about what it, you know, whether or not you were disappointed that you couldn't tour in 2020 because of that was supposed to be the big anniversary um, tour for Who Is Jill Scott? And I loved your answer because you talked about how you didn't necessarily miss touring, how you were discovering all these things about yourself during the pandemic. What else have you, or what are some of the things that you discover about yourself as we've all been forced into this period of quiet? Um, I've discovered that I really want to go back to school. I would love to go to a class. I would love to raise my hand and answer, ask questions. 
you know, like there's the, in order to get, I guess, another degree, which would be cool, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that I wouldn't mind taking some journalism. You know. Oh snap! Come on to the arena, Jill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's really nice. I I, I wonder though, because um, you know, it is an art, as you know, <laughs> and um, right and for some reason people think <laughs> that i'm judging you know i'm like you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no hun no where would they get that from <laughs> mm-hmm. it's okay. a lot of it's a lot of misconceptions you know and and preconceived you know ideas about who i am and ah hmm. like all i could do is if you get to know me you get to know me that's all I could tell you. Yeah. So what do you think you would, you think you would study journalism if you went back to school? Like if you can go back. Yeah. Home. And I also think I'd yeah. still want to be a therapist. Huh. Yeah. I, I, I have a therapist and um, I see the benefits and I, I think I could be beneficial. Like what else can, what can you do? Do you ever hear this? What can you do? Punchinella, Punchinella. Oh yeah, yeah. I, that. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's old school. That yeah, was my that's yeah, that's my mother's thing, you know. But nonetheless, that's how I feel. Like, what else could I do? What what else could I do? Hmm. Could you envision yourself walking away from music entirely? No. No, I'll I'll be in some little club somewhere in in Austria. Yeah, I mean, like it it feels too good. I would I would miss it too much. There's 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 no yeah. You know that part in Color Purple when Suge gave me says, Oh, Miss Seely, I feels like singing. You know, I get those moments like, Oh, I just I just wanna be with a band. I love live music, so you know, I couldn't give it up. Mm-mm. As um as someone who performs a, a lot. What is it going to take for you to feel comfortable performing again with everything going on? Who? Everybody's asking me this, meaning my team. My <laughs> team is like, so what's up? And um, I, you know, I'm 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 still on the fence about this uh, vaccine. I'm on the fence. I did have my first shot. My sister um, forced me, <laughs> um, and I'll get the second, and I'll see how it goes. You know, I'll just I'll just see how it goes. I don't know. None of us know anything. Did you have any side effects? I got the Moderna one. Which one did did you? Get? Um, starts with Pfizer. Pfizer. Okay. Yeah, did you feel yeah. okay after? Yeah, I felt fine. A little a little sleepy, mm-hmm. but I take naps anyway, so I wasn't tripping. <laughs> I was like, oh, all right, y'all. See you. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's all good. Oh, have you watched them yet? Not yet. Um, I'm, I've i heard mixed things about it. I, I don't know what to. Yeah. Is, is it? Would you recommend? Would you yes, not I would. recommend? If you, you recommend. love okay. if you love film. If mm-hmm. you love acting, if you love good lighting, if you love I do love um, all those things. <laughs> yeah, man. Um plots, if you love uh horror, they I I cannot I cannot believe how well this was done. I'm just geek. Lil Marvin, I don't know you, man, but uh he wrote and I believe uh directed. No, I don't know if he directed, but I know he wrote it. And uh, man, brilliant! I mean, there's like a, so much TV out here right now. I just like I just finished Bridgerton, like that was the I hadn't watched it yet, which was it's it's um it's kind of the perfect pandemic watch. You know, you get through it fast. It's a lot of sex in it. Like it's yeah. <laughs> you know it gets you through. But them is definitely on my list. I'll probably get to that after I finish Falcon and Winter Soldier because I'm a big I, Marvel comic head. Me too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, it's very disturbing. That's what everybody says. It's disturbing. Says. It's disturbing. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Well All done. Right, I'm gonna have to sit with that. 
when you're well when you're talking discovery. about yeah as a writer when you're talking about creating emotions and feelings i i have fear at night now based on what i saw and i'm i'm a grown ass woman and i i feel it wow yeah. well okay. done beautifully that's a good done. endorsement yeah um, beautifully done <laughs> before i get to the game i play with uh all of my guests uh i'm sure you were very aware of the overwhelmingly positive reaction to your verses with Erica Badu, mm-hmm. um, which, I mean, I, the level of love that was just pouring through Instagram and through social media period for you two celebrating each other. I think it changed the tone of how people thought about the verses. People were really thinking about them as competitions, but you all successfully changed the tone. Um, but it nevertheless made me wonder, would you, or would you all consider ever doing an album together? Because those seem to be a thing now where people are doing collaboration albums with other artists. Is that something that you would ever think about? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've suggested this a few times. Have you really? Okay. Well, I, the tour, the album, not necessarily. It's the touring for a me. touring together. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. we did it before with with Sugar Water years ago, a couple of times. Um, and that was really, really successful. I'm like, let's do it again, you know, but you know, Miss Badu is on her own thing now. <laughs> she you know, is. Yes, she is. <laughs> you have such a, a great uh, spirit, Jill. I feel bad putting you through this game, but that's not going to stop me from doing it anyway. <laughs> oh, so up. Okay. Well, let me <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Take a drink. Uh, it's a simple game. It's called this or that. I give you two choices and you just pick one. Now, I've purposely made these questions tough just for you. So these will okay. be hard choices. So And then it's 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 the answer without an explanation. You can answer with an explanation, absolutely. If you feel like you need to offer one. Sometimes people feel like it's so obvious that they don't need to offer one. But you are look, I am just here in your light. You can explain all of them. <laughs> For however long you would like. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. First one. Um, do you want it in your pickle beets or do you want it on your candy sweets? Candy sweets. Candy sweets. All right. Mm-hmm. Easy like, enough. Yes. Um, do you actually eat pickle beets? I do not. I don't like beets at all. And it's, <sighs> do you Thank want you. It, it? It's actually B-E-A-T-S. <gasps> I thought it was pickle beets. It's oh. your, it's big old beets. Ah, man, listen, because it's because the food thing, I was like, pickle beets. Is that a big thing? old beets? Big old beets. See, this is why you need Jill Scott to clarify <laughs> something like a lot of black people have done. Well, we'll be saying the wrong damn laugh <laughs> for the entire existence of a song. So thank you for I correcting me. Um, yeah. Uh, golden time of day or happy feelings? Golden time of day. Something about that song. It just just hit you right in the heart. It's a guarantee. (laughs) Like I've seen Frankie Beverly so many times live. I thought when I was a child, when I grew up, I was gonna have a baby with him. (laughs) That was my plan. You were probably 80% of the female population. (laughs) Oh my God. But as a little kid, like, you know, yeah, a lot older than me. I'm like 12, like when I grow up. Yeah. um, Yeah. Oh yeah. Golden time. I cry every time I hear it live. Mm. Every time he sings it, I just sob and it feels so good. Um, golden or so blessed? Speaking of songs that make you feel something. <laughs> Me personally, right? Me yes, pers- you. Okay, 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 okay. I don't know. I know. Um, I gotta go with blessed for me. So that's, do you think most it. of your fans would say golden? Is that why probably. you probably okay. Yeah, yeah. Probably everybody would say golden. I'd say golden too. You know, especially when I'm on a treadmill. But um but blessed it really it really defines, you know, this this time in my my whole mm. life. Uh sexual healing or distant lover? Distant lover. 
I agree. And I love sexual healing, but it's something about distant lover that just... Mm, mm, mm. That's something that, else. Yeah. It's what is that, it about it? <laughs> it's the reconnect. It's that reconnect, I think. You know, you haven't seen somebody that you want to be with in so long, and then you get a chance to do, to do it. <laughs> so nice. And finally... Miss Jill Scott, beautifully human, or who is Jill Scott? Who is Jill Scott? Mm. Yeah. I was trying to destroy my career with beautifully human. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> because fame was hard for me. Mm. It was really weird. Like, what is happening? You know, people, you know, like, it was a lot of coming at me real fast. I don't like that. I'm from North Philly. I, I don't know what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. It was a lot of this and it made, it made me feel uncomfortable. So I thought, well, I'll do an album that nobody likes and then they'll leave me alone. You really thought that nobody was going to like this album. I, I did. I'm not sure why you would have thought that <laughs> given what the songs are on that. Cause that's crossed my mind is on that. Correct. Mm-hmm. I won a you Grammy. Got, and you won a Grammy for it, right. And and Golden was the Golden, Golden Globe song for I don't know how many yeah. years after that. I Am Not Afraid. Uh, the fact is, I need you. Uh, <laughs> mm. You need to try a lot harder or stop or better yet. You should oh, have I, not tried at all. <laughs> I, give, I gave that up. I just, um, mm. I don't know. I was just really, really trying to find balance in it. Like I... I don't know if I mentioned to you, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. So, you know, it was a lot different. You know, it was just a lot of difference and I wasn't quite ready. I didn't know, I didn't even know who to ask. And I tried, I asked everybody I met. I asked Michael Jordan, I asked uh, Mary J. Blige, I asked uh, Tina Marie, I asked Patti LaBelle. Um, I asked everybody that I came across, Denzel Washington, Quincy Jones, how do you do this? <laughs> Somebody tell me, how do you do this? And the best advice I got was get a stylist. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I didn't understand. I thought she was crazy. It was Juanita Jordan. And I thought, shout out to Juanita. I thought she was nuts. I was like, get a stylist. All these people have lost their minds. They're soulless. What is this? I didn't know any better. But uh, what she meant was, if you look good, you know, you'll you'll be fine. Like you can just slide through. I understand that. But I read. I want to do more than that. I'd rather be inside myself. I don't. And if I'm not inside myself, I want to know that I'm not inside myself, and I can just, you know. Um, even have peace with that. Like I'm uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Just sit in everything that I am rather than trying to be something for anybody. Well, that is a perfect way to end what has been one of the best conversations I've ever had with Stop one of my favorite it. people. I'm not even kidding. I'm not with one of my favorite people who I don't quite know, but I'm just going to act like I know her, know her who has been there my whole life. Damn. Uh, or at least my romantic life. Definitely. So it's just like right when I was getting in the thick of serious adult relationships, here comes Jill Scott to make me help me make sense of that thing called love. So I appreciate Ooh. you, Jill. Um, just for not just the music you've given us, but just giving us a little piece of yourself. Thank you for allowing us to enjoy that. My we all pleasure. appreciated it. Really? <laughs> um, oh, and uh, congrats on, you have a wellness app as well that's coming out, correct? It's coming. It's a slow process, but it's worth it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's called True Voice. It is a green book in a sense um, for all of us. So wherever you are, uh, starting with this country, and you need to find a um, a natural, a holistic hairstylist. If you need to find um, a holistic doctor, if you need to find, um, you know, a black gynecologist, 
you know. Oh, that's what's up. Yeah. 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 Because when we moved to Nashville, I couldn't find shit from Shalula. Mm -hmm. I was like, where are my people at? I don't understand. Um, And then when I went and found a a black gynecologist, it was like at a clinic and I don't do clinics. I got bad history with clinics. So I was like, "Ah," you know, so, um, you know, it's it's a green book. And it's that's yeah. very helpful. Yeah, because uh, I mean, I've only had one black gynecologist my whole life. Mm-hmm. So that's it is hard to find. So I'm sure a lot of people will be very thankful for such a resource that puts everything in one place. Yeah. And be clear, they're not just black. You know, they're also mm-hmm. highly qualified and <laughs> extremely good at what they do. Okay. You know, <laughs> so it's not it's really not just about color. It's mm-hmm. also about finding quality as well. So if you're looking for a great uh, black owned restaurant, you know what I mean? You're not, I'm not sending you, you know, to the place where they burn everything and, you know, somebody got their hair in it, like <laughs> in your, in your collard greens. Yeah. I, I hear you. Uh, but yeah, the, the fact that it would be reputable That's uh, right. is definitely un- is understood in the, in the headline on this, but nevertheless, I'm sure a lot of people will look forward to that. Uh, again, thank you so much for this time. As you all know, uh, Jill is getting out of here. Y'all know what's coming up next. Fuck it, I'm bothered. <laughs> Jill, thank you so much for this. Oh, you just edified my whole spirit. And literally, this is going to be the highlight. This might be the highlight of 2021. Stop <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, oh, this God. was really amazing. So thank, thank you, you so for- much for such. I'm, I'm stopping you because you've been you've been giving me all this praise and love and, you know, affirming since I got on here with you. But let me it's my turn. Thank you so very much for being a journalist, for asking real questions, even the ones at the end where it was mostly my shit. But, you know, <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, I appreciate you and congratulations on every success and your happy marriage. Thank you. That's a <laughs> I appreciate- Yeah, ma'am. That's a major accomplishment in today, you know, yeah. today's society. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate you saying that. That is that is definitely the best thing that I've done in my life is is marry my husband a hundred percent. Yeah. So Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yes. And uh now we're gonna listen to Crown Royal, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I keep I keep hearing I'm supposed to make it longer. I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. Don't play with my emotions. For real? I I, I might as well make it 30 minutes. Some of us might not make it that long, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> then then there's goals. Yeah, you know I mean, um, like there's goals. And and two, I think that people think that once the nut has occurred that the sex has stopped. No. That's not it. That's not it. No, oh, not baby, at all. you watching too much porn. <laughs> <laughs> you missing out on some beautiful things. Beautiful things. Beautiful. Well, well, now you got me curious. Was there a reason you made it short? It's all I had to say. <laughs> that, would be, that would be the good reason, right? <laughs> yeah. It was all I had to say. And it, it happened so quick. The The lines were happening as as the the music was playing and I was just saying it. I think I just said the whole thing out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. And we went back and listened to it, uh, J.R. Hudson and I, and he was like, you gotta record that. I was like, I think I do. <laughs> like <it> was... <laughs> <laughs> well, the, an extended version, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> That's all yeah. I gotta say. Yeah, that'd be dope. Yeah, sure. it, it requires, yeah. it requires, um, a lot of writing and a a whole lot more i'll probably have to just get some in the back room and then come into the studio like that'll have to be the process like it needs to be fresh fresh yeah that's right (laughs) (laughs) jill you are a fool Mm. Uh, i don't want to hold you up for the rest of your day thank you again for spending this time this was a pleasure really it was awesome sauce thank you so much all right take care 